what I tell them is it's time for just any leadership. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a group really very much like this. It was in Chinatown in Seattle's International District. And it was with a group of people who really didn't know me, even though I had campaigned twice. I've been elected in King County. I've campaigned a lot in Chinatown. But uh, this group just really wasn't that familiar with me. The few people who invited me knew me, but otherwise, a lot of new faces. And um, after I got done talking, this one woman in the very front raised her hand. She said, Bill, tell me how you're different from Jay Inslee. <laughs> and the first thing that came out of my mouth was, in so many ways. And then uh, I gave her one or two reasons, and we kind of moved on. And later when I got in the car, I thought, you know, that was a really good question. Um, and in 10 months of campaigning, actually, it's almost 12 months. We, I announced it around Memorial Day last year, so it's almost been 12 months of campaigning. No one had asked me that question before. And uh, so I, I started thinking about, what is a really good answer, and why are we really different? And I came to the, the decision, or at least the, I think the understanding, that there are a number of ways we're different, but they all stem from the same root. And that is that I come from the private sector. And I've built a company that operates on both sides of the mountains. And Jay Inslee is a career politician, and he's a congressman. And I think when you look at some of the areas and the ways in which we're different, they all stem from the fact that my grounding is really in the private sector, in the business world, and Jay's is in the very partisan political world. And let me give you three ways that we're different, and three ways where I think that is very apparent, the differences between us. And that way, if after you leave here tonight, somebody, you run into somebody, and they say, well, who is this Bill Bryant guy, and how is he different from the guy we got in there right now? You can give them three ways that we're different. And the first is leadership. Jay Inslee has introduced a very partisan, I would say hyper-partisan, divisive leadership style, if you want to call it a leadership style, it's just a style. Uh, but he's introduced a very hyper-partisan, divisive style in Olympia. It's very typical of how you do business as a congressman in Washington, D.C. It's not how you should behave as a governor in Washington State. It's not how we do business. And it's not how I was brought up to lead. Um, I really learned an awful lot about leadership when I worked for the Apple industry in central Washington and uh, Yakima and Wenatchee. I grew up over on the coast. I was born in Morton. Anybody know where Morton is? Yes. Okay, born in Morton. My family's from that whole area. Mom and dad grew up in Mossy Rock. Um, but I didn't live in Morton very long because shortly after I was born, dad got a job teaching school over in the Hood Canal School District in the Spokane Reservation. And um, I grew up there and then went back east to college, came home after getting a degree in trade and diplomacy, and worked for Governor John Spellman on international trade issues. And after Spellman lost, I stayed on for a few months to get the Gardner administration squared away, and then I moved to Yakima, where I did the international trade negotiations for the apple, pear, and cherry industry in Washington State. My job was to open up new export markets for Washington State's apple industry. And that's because when I went to there, to move to Yakima and start with the industry in 1985, we had 35 million box crops of apples. And the industry knew that within a few years, we were going to start harvesting, harvesting 50 million boxes of apples. And they knew that then in Washington, the United States, we were not going to be able to eat another 15 million boxes of apples on our own. And so that we were going to need some new export markets as these crops got larger and larger. And so my job was to run around the world and, and open up new markets for Washington State apples. So when these large crops started coming off the trees, we would have markets for them. It taught me the importance of building coalitions and that you really lead by building coalitions. Because if I was opening up a new market for Washington apples, let's say Mexico, and I started out, Mexico took zero boxes of apples. They would not let our apples into their country. Today, Mexico will take about 10% of the crop. It's one of our largest markets, but at the time it took zero. So what I'd have to do is I'd have to get on a plane, go down to Mexico City, and, and I did this for whatever country I was working with. to go to the capital and meet with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Agriculture, and find out from them why aren't you letting our apples into your country. And if I had to deal with two or three or four different ministries, I usually got two or three or four different answers. And so what I'd have to do is work with the foreign government to make sure that I could get them on the same page, and they would come to an understanding of what it would take to let us ship apples into their country. And usually they want us to grow slightly differently, or package them differently, or store them differently, or inspect them differently. 
And so I'd get all that kind of roughly worked out and come back to Wenatchee or Yakima and say, okay, guys, good news. We can, we can export our apples to this country now, but you're going to have to grow them differently or package them differently or inspect them differently. And usually the guys would say, well, we're not doing that, you know. It's well, how the way we're doing it now is good enough for everybody else. Why, why do we have to do something different for this country? And I say, okay, let's, let's calm down. Let's figure out how we can do what the country's asking for, but in a way that allows you to commercially do what you need to do and see where there might be a common ground. And then I had to go to Washington, D.C. and meet with our own U.S. Department of Agriculture and our own trade representative and make sure they were comfortable with what we were negotiating with the foreign government. And in many cases, they had to step in and actually conclude the negotiations. It was three-dimensional chess. You had to keep the foreign government, the U.S. government, and the industry all moving in the same direction at the same time. And the only way you could do that was to build a coalition around the idea that what we were working toward was going to benefit everyone. And everyone needed to understand how that endpoint would benefit them and build a coalition around that endpoint and keep them focused on the end, not get mired down in the day-to-day -day differences. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly the kind of leadership we need in Olympia right now. And it's exactly the kind of leadership we do not have. If you need one statistic which shows, uh, reveals the governor's inability to build coalitions and lead, it's this one. In eight very difficult economic years, his predecessor, Governor Greg Warren, eight years, had seven special sessions. In three and a half years, Governor Inslee just finished his seventh special session. It reveals an inability to pull people together to identify an endpoint and move that coalition towards that end. And that's the kind of leadership I have provided in the private sector and it's the kind of leadership I'll provide to the people of Washington State. The second is taxes. Do you want a difference between us? It's taxes. Candidate Inslee, if you remember, said that he would veto any tax increase. It was made very clear, he didn't just say it once, he said he would veto any tax increase. Ladies and gentlemen, his hand was barely off the Bible after having been sworn in before he ran back to his office and started proposing new taxes. And in four out of four years, he has proposed billions of dollars in new taxes. That's not how I would. Um, in 1992, I had opened up enough, by 1992, I'd opened up new markets uh, around the world for Washington's apples that a lot of other agricultural groups started calling me. Uh, the potato industry here, hops, um, wine grapes, soybeans in the Midwest, Florida citrus. And they were saying, you know, we got some problems. How would you help us with that? And I realized there was an opportunity. So in 1992, my wife and I moved over to the coast to Seattle, and I set up my company, which helps uh, farmers and uh, grower groups export their crops around the world. I have run that company for the last 25 years, every year in the black since the second month. And that's because I'm fiscally conservative, and I focus our resources on what's going to move us forward. In 2007, my company had grown to a point where I didn't need to be there every day. And I went on a few nonprofit boards because I want to start getting involved in my community. And then I saw that a seat was coming up for re-election on the King County Seattle Port Commission. Uh, the King County Seattle Port Commission is one of the five top job, job generators in Washington State. 200,000 jobs depend upon the Port of Seattle. One third of our gross domestic product moves across the maritime uh, docks in Seattle and Tacoma. And I was very concerned that it was not being run very fiscally responsibly. And that's because the Port Commission at the time raised the property tax to the maximum legal amount they could, the amount, maximum legal amount every year, not because they needed to, but just because they could. And when you start raising the taxes to the maximum legal amount, whether you need it or not, that prevents you from having to set priorities. And if you're not setting priorities, you're probably nearly not preparing for what's likely to come at you. And that's what I saw happen. I saw some real competitive threats coming at the port in 10 years, possibly putting us in a position where we could lose thousands of jobs to British Columbia unless we got our financial house in order and really focused our resources on those programs that would help increase our competitiveness. So I ran as a Republican running in King County. Not a whole lot of people gave me much of a chance of winning. I heard over and over again, you know, you're never going to win and patted me on the head. Um, but we pulled it off with 50% in bits and pieces, staying out of recount territory. And uh, since I had run on this platform of fiscal responsibility, 
the other commissioner said, well, Bill, why don't you be the commissioner who kind of works alongside the staff this year on the budget? I said, yes, because I knew that if you control the budget, you control the direction of the institution. And I got in there, the, the budget at the Port of Seattle is between, depending on what we're building, 700 million and a billion two. And uh, I started looking at it and realizing there were some programs that had been gone on for years and years, but you know maybe weren't as necessary as they once were. And there were some assets that were performing well, but they were tethered to assets that weren't perform as well, performing as well. I thought, you know, if we just kind of separate these and change these a little bit without a lot of dramatic changes at all, um, we can put together a budget that would hold the property tax flat. And I thought I was going to be a hero. Instead, there were staff that uh, began to say, we got this young rogue commissioner. And uh, I had to really then build a coalition of stakeholders and my colleagues on the commission and the staff and help them understand that this, this budget wasn't just a budget. It was the first step in a 10-year plan to increase our global competitiveness and keep jobs in Washington State. And we put together a budget that year that for the first time in years held the property tax flat. And every year for the eight years that I was on there, and I just voted on my last budget in November, um, every year, uh, my eight years, we passed budgets that held the property tax flat or cut it in real terms. So much so that the last budget I voted on in uh, November of 2015 uh, collected millions of dollars less from the people of King County, even though we had expanded services to the people of King County and Washington State. Contrast that to what happened last year where the governor had billions of dollars in new revenue, and it wasn't enough. And when the revenue projection came out halfway through the, uh, the session in 2015, and it showed that there was a few hundred million dollars more in revenue, he still was insisting on some sort of capital gains for carbon tax. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not have an absence of revenue in Olympia. We have an absence of leadership in the governor's office, and it needs to change. The third area where we're really different is strategic planning. And uh, I learned how the importance of strategic planning working for the Apple industry. They taught me that you know you better make sure whether what you're planning today is what you want to harvest in four, and seven, and ten years. Um, they remember they hired me when they had a 35 million box crop, but they were looking at 50 million boxes. They didn't wait till they had 50 million boxes to hire me. They hired me before that crop came off the trees. So they knew when it did, they would have markets. Today, the Apple industry isn't producing 35 million boxes. It's profitably selling 120 to 140 million boxes of apples throughout North America and around the world. But that's because they're always looking 10 years out. When I ran for a seat on the Board Commission, I was very concerned that not only was it not fiscally responsibly run, but it wasn't looking 10 years out. And there were some real competitive threats coming at us. And if we didn't make some serious changes, that we were at risk of losing our jobs to British Columbia. And one of those changes was the need to consolidate the seaports of Seattle and Tacoma into a single seaport. Talk about the need to build coalitions. <coughs> These are two seaports that had competed against each other for 100 years, literally. The staffs, you know, barely worked together well on different projects. These were very competitive ports. The law was written in such a way that forced them to compete. And after 100 years, they'd gotten really good at it. But I realized that if we were to continue to compete, what was going to happen is that we were going to be eating each other's lunch while British Columbia just moved forward and passed us by. And so I suggested that we consolidate the two seaports. I put together a proposal in 2009, in January 2009, and once again everybody patted me on the head and said it's never going to happen. Um, but in August of 2015, after a lot of coalition building on the part of a lot of different people, we signed the five commissioners in Green County and the five commissioners in Pierce County, signed the agreement creating the third largest port gateway in North America, LA Long Beach, New York, New Jersey, Puget Sound. And we've let the world know we are going to fight to keep those jobs here in Washington State. Listen, I have done this in the private sector for my company. I have done it in the public sector for the Port of Seattle. And as your governor, I will do it for the people of Washington State. Jay Inslee, he has no strategic plan. And that's really unconscionable when you think of all the assets we have to work with in Washington. <laughs> think about what really generates jobs in Washington State. We have trade and tourism, or trade and transportation. We have tourism. We have technology. We have manufacturing. Everything from Boeing to carbon fiber here in Moses Lake to precision equipment in Walla Wall. We have um, medical science, medical research, global health. We have the military. We have agriculture. We have forestry. We have fisheries. And we have energy. 
We have all ten. There are some states that would love to have three or four of those. <laughs> Arizona, Arkansas, Utah, they'd love to have four of them. We've got all ten. But we have no strategic plan on how to take the regulatory power of the state and the budget of the state and use it in a way that helps the private sector generate jobs in each of those ten areas. If you're a CEO and you don't have a strategic plan for where you want to take your company, well, you could best put it into a maintenance mode. But if you're a governor and you have no sense of where you want the state to move, what direction you want the state to move over 10 years, then a budget is no longer a document really driving you towards a 10-year objective. A budget then is reduced to a document that is whatever it takes to get 50 votes in the Senate, or 50 votes in the House and 25 in the Senate, and that you're willing to sign whether it moves you in any particular direction or not. That's not what a budget should be. A budget should be moving you towards a longer term objective. If you're a governor and you don't know where that objective is, then yeah, you've just reduced the budget to a political battle and to get, it, get whatever you can get to get the votes and get the legislature out of town. But that's not moving us in a particular direction. If you have a governor who's not engaged and doesn't have a strategic plan, doesn't really know where he or she would like to take the state, you know what you get? You get broken bureaucracies. You know what broken bureaucracies look like? <laughs> broken bureaucracies are a department of corrections that lets prisoners out early. Mm -hmm. It's a department of transportation that creates traffic jams. It's a health care authority that makes between a 70 and $470 million cost calculation error. It's a state hospital that endangers patients and employees and allows patients to escape. That's what happens when you have no one who's really running the show. What's worse, if you are a governor and you have no strategic plan, you've turned over your government to the department heads and to the regulators. And you know what happens when you do that? You get a culture of no. I had a, a CEO call me at the end of last summer, and he said, Bill, it's not final yet, but I want to give you a heads up. It's very likely that next year, which is now this year, uh, next year we're going to be moving three or 400 jobs out of Washington State. I said, OK, why? He said, there's just a culture of no, and I'm tired of it. He said, every time I want to do something, I've got an agency telling me why I can't do it. And the way they want me to do it, it's not going to pencil out. He said, I don't know how, but this other governor heard about my problems and asked me to fly down and meet with him. I got down there. He had two agency heads in the cabinet room, and he and the two agency heads sat around the table that day and helped me figure out how I could get done what I wanted to get done in their state. He said, until you can turn this culture of no into a culture of yes, good family wage jobs are going to keep leaving Washington not allow that to happen. So how is your governor, how am I going to turn this culture of no into a culture of yes? I'll tell you four things. First, on day one, I replaced the leadership in every department from the top as far down as we could possibly go. Whoa. Day one, I announced a zero-based budget initiative. That means over the course of four years, we are going to rebuild the budget from zero all the way up. We'll set strategic objectives for every department. And then we will examine every agency, every program, and every tax incentive. And if they're not moving us towards those strategic objectives, we either fix them or we eliminate them. Day one, I announced a moratorium on all new regulations until the departments can justify the ones that we've already got. And when they justify the ones that we've got and we lift the moratorium, we'll have a fixed sunset review date on every new regulation. And we will eliminate the arbitrary, uncertain permitting policies Governor Inslee has introduced that is keeping jobs and investment out of Washington State. We can do that in four years. And by doing that in four years, we will turn this culture of no into a culture of yes. And we will help generate jobs and communities all across Washington State. But to do it, you know what we have to do? Win. <laughs> we have to win. We have, we, have, <laughs> we have mastered, as the Republican Party, 49%. We know how to get 49% of the vote. Dino Rossi statistically tied. Rob McKenna lost by 94,000 votes. Do you know why Rob McKenna lost by 94,000 votes? Cheated. Because Central and Eastern Washington didn't vote in the same percentage as King County. If Benton County alone had voted in the same percentage as King County, Dino Rossi would have been elected governor well out of recount territory. We, 90, Rob lost by 94,000 votes. We've identified 107,000 people who probably would have voted for Rob but didn't turn in a ballot because they didn't think it would matter. 
If those people had voted, we would be talking mm -hmm. about Governor McKenna running for re-election. Mm -hmm. But they didn't vote. And I get it. I lived in Yakima. And I know when I lived in Yakima, people said, well, it doesn't matter whether we vote or not, because King County is going to decide it. And then I moved to King County, and I ran for office in King County. And I realized, yeah, King County is a third of the state. My district that I ran in was three congressional districts, 15 legislative districts. It's a third of the state. But two-thirds of the state is outside King County. And there's a lot of King County that is, will, will vote for Republicans. I win in King County. It's not all of King County. But the thing is, is that people in King County vote. And we've got to get people in Central and Eastern Washington understanding that their vote does matter. I think oftentimes we know that we have enough votes in these legislative districts to elect our senators and our representatives. We have enough Republican votes to elect our mayors and our county commissioners. So everybody feels comfortable, you know, they're going to be fine. But you've got to remember, your vote matters a lot in the statewide elections. Mm -hmm. And we need to turn out the vote in Central and Eastern Washington. We have identified exactly how many votes we need in each legislative district and in each county. And we're right, figuring out very quickly because of phoning and doorbelling and everything we've been doing for the last year exactly who those people are. What I need help with is calling them and making sure when it comes to the primary in July. And about, anybody know how many days until the election? About 65. <laughs> Ballots drop July 15th. And they'll be collected by August 2nd, and then we'll have the general. But we've got to make sure that we have a strong <laughs> showing. That's largely because we have an open congressional seat in downtown Seattle. And everyone, we have three very strong candidates, it's going to be narrowed down to two. So you can bet everybody who cares in Seattle is going to be voting for those congressional candidates. And they'll also, by the way, vote for the governor. We need to have enough votes in central and eastern Washington to show that we have a strong campaign. And only you guys can deliver that. So if you're willing to help, please, go on my Facebook page if you're not following me already and like it. I would really appreciate it if you would ask your friends to like my Facebook page or share one or two posts a week. If you like to see a post you like, just hit share. It'll go to your friends. And if you could tonight go home and email five to 10 friends and say, hey, I heard Bill speak. Please check out his website, BillBryantForGovernor.com. If you can get people in your circles to begin going to the website and liking the Facebook page, and if you're willing to call 25 people in your neighborhood, we can put together the 51% that we win. And when we do that, we'll turn this culture of no into a culture of yes. And ladies and gentlemen, it's time. Thank you.